And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. More than 10 years ago, I, I wrote an article entitled, The Ultimate Buy and Hold Strategy. And at that time, uh, people in the office gave me a real ribbing for calling it the ultimate. And their, their, their question to me was, will anybody believe that this is the ultimate buy and hold strategy? Why should they believe you? And my response was, and it still is today, is that we all should have what we consider to be the ultimate buy and hold strategy or the ultimate market timing strategy or the ultimate stock picking strategy. The word ultimate in my case, and I hope in your case as well, is simply the best that you know. I know we'd all like to have put $10,000 in Microsoft in 1986 and have it grow to be worth millions. But that isn't a strategy we can put to work and say, look, this today, here's how I want to invest my money. This is the best way I know how. We can't by the past, it is a question of how we position ourselves for the future. And what I was looking for, and still looking for improvements when we, when we can find them, is a strategy that had a long history of success, that it would could be managed and uh, simply, you, you didn't have to be an insider. You didn't have to have a friend who's a guru or any special kind of research that would give you the return and exposure to the risk that you're willing to take. And it would be a strategy that you could keep the faith, that you would have an emotional belief that this is a terrific way to invest money. And it should be a way that will work in good times and bad. And so what I would like to talk about now is that strategy. I want to encourage you to, to read the article at paulmerriman.com entitled The Ultimate Buy and Hold Strategy. You can find a, a slightly different kind of a, an approach to explaining the strategy there. Uh, I also recently wrote an article for Market Watch. You might want to review that. And I think you would probably find it interesting to see what kinds of comments people made about the strategy. But what I know is it's the best that I have found. In this discussion, I will be focusing on a very specific asset allocation, one that is 60% in equities, 40% in fixed income. I'll explain in a second why I picked that one, but uh, I want to make it very clear that I am not suggesting for a moment that you, a uh, 25-year-old, should be 60-40 or that you, 85-year-old, should be 60-40. I simply want to make the case for this combination of equity asset classes and fixed income so that you will see the impact of the way that the portfolio is being built. And then some of you may choose to be 100% equity with the same strategy, basically, or some of you may be 30% equity because you're more conservative. But I want there to be, in essence, a, a benchmark here created to give us a chance to, uh, to show you how to get better rates of return without raising your risk. And, and trust me, it is very significant. Now, this 60-40, 60% equity, 40% fixed income, this is a pretty common asset allocation. Uh, probably a little too risky for most retirees. I myself am half in equities and half in bonds, but but most pension funds uh, have a 60-40 kind of mix because historically what happens is that the 40% the in fixed income is a good 
defensive strategy to protect against getting the, the full brunt of a bear market. And the 60% in equities gives you an opportunity to participate uh, on the upside. And, and what you're going to see in a few minutes is that uh, historically, at least that 60-40 picks up about 85% of uh, the market's return. So if you're, and, and, and we're going to start here in just a second with a very basic portfolio that's the S&P 500 and a bond index. And, uh, but if you looked at just the S&P 500 going back to 1926 or 27 and had 40% in bonds, you would find out that you get about 85% of the return of the S&P 500. So it's been a very popular asset allocation uh, for professionals, uh, particularly pension funds, where they can't take a lot of risk, but they need to take some risk so they get some growth for the future. And this is a strategy, by the way, that is very easy to understand. It is easy to apply. In fact, uh, I, I hope that after you've gone through this, you'll you'll go over to uh, paulmerriman.com and and look at the ETF portfolios, look at the Vanguard portfolio, look at the ways that you can actually do this for yourself uh, simply and easily and hopefully understandably. So here's what we're going to do that's different. Just a kind of an overview. I'm going to start with the basic. S&P 500 bond mix. And then I'm going to start adding little pieces, not, not very much of anything, but little pieces of, of, of small company uh, indexes and value indexes and international indexes and REITs and, and emerging markets. Uh, and, and just look at it kind of one piece at a time, what that does to the return of the portfolio as well as the uh, as as the risk. Now it's going to be important, I think, that you uh, go to the resources uh, link at paulmerriman.com, and uh, there is uh, a if you, there's a drop down there where you can uh, click on the uh, buy and hold graphs because we're going to be looking both at some pie graphs and some tables that you'll find there. So you may even want to just stop the recording and go do that so that you can look at these while I'm going through these step by step in terms of the important changes that I'm recommending and the impact of those changes. So let's go for a second to uh, the first pie, the pie chart, pie graph, um, and you'll notice that this is a combination of the S&P 500 and a, a bond index, Barclays Government Credit Index. It's a combination of both government and uh, corporate. And you'll see in the box to the left of the pie graph, you'll see uh, the return, the annualized return from 1970 through 2012 with that 60-40 balance. And that's 8.5%. And the uh, annualized standard deviation, 11.6%. Now that standard deviation is simply a measurement of volatility. And so as we change the holdings in this portfolio, I want to see whether it has the impact of lowering that volatility or increasing that volatility, or does it stay the same, and how does it relate to the annualized return because the goal here is to get you a better rate of return while either reducing risk or keeping risk the same. So uh, let, we'll track that in just a minute. But I also want you to notice there in that uh, step one uh, graph, it says that $100,000 over that 43-year uh, period grew to three million two hundred and eighty one thousand eight hundred and sixty five dollars that is just simply the impact of having something compound for 43 years starting with a hundred thousand at eight and a half percent 
Now, you probably know this if you're as old as I am, but $100,000 was a lot of money uh, in terms of buying power back in 1970. Not everybody was walking around in their portfolio with 100000 like today. Many people certainly have $100,000 uh, in their savings program, their retirement program. But to the extent that uh, that's way beyond the, what you would consider to be uh, your normal, uh, you can if, if you have ten thousand, you can divide these numbers by ten. If you have fifty thousand, you can divide by two. But um, the hundred thousand, I thought, was easy to work with. And uh, and certainly in today's uh, saving environment, uh, not an impossibility. So. 8.5% compound rate of return, 11.6% standard deviation. Uh, I might say that uh, to put that risk another way, you're going to have a point at, in, this, in this strategy that you're going to probably lose uh, 30% in a year. Um, those are the kinds of markets that come along seldom, but uh, that would be kind of the devastating uh, worst case year that at least from my back, what I know, um, looking backwards. So that is portfolio number one, and and uh, and so what what do what do we know here? We know we have a portfolio that has some defense, and that fixed income will protect you against the market going down if you compare to having all your money in equities. We also know that you've got a lot of growth potential in that portfolio. And we're going to use this 8.5% as the benchmark for this study. Is it possible, without taking more risk, to actually increase your return? Now, we want to look at everything you own in the portfolio and make sure that it, in fact, qualifies, if you will, for the term ultimate. So go with me, if you will, to step number two, because in that second pie graph, we're going to make one small change. This is not a life changer, but as I said before, every piece needs to be built correctly, not just for return, but for risk. And what we know is, is that there, there are some things that, that we can do to reduce the risk of bonds. One is we can have a portfolio of bonds that's all governments uh, or mutual funds made up of government bonds. Government bonds, U.S. government bonds, do not have a history of defaulting. Corporate bonds do. And so we want to focus in this portfolio on the risk-taking with the equities part of the portfolio. We don't want to take much risk with the fixed income part of the portfolio. So it's all governments. And I will tell you that the point that you really care about having the bonds there to protect you against uh, the downside of the equity portion is when we're in a very, very bad bear market, like 2008, a terrible bear market. And, and corporates didn't do so well. High yields were terrible. But the government bonds actually went up during that period of time. And that's when you want this bond portion to be something that truly is as guaranteed as we know to get. Now, the other thing is, is that we know with bonds, if you go long term with bonds, you have a lot of sensitivity and volatility if interest rates start going up or going down. And what we know, at least historically, is that if you go past intermediates and continue to take more risk, you don't get very much more return for all the risk that you take with long bonds. And so in the portfolio that I call the ultimate buy and hold portfolio, whatever portion you have in fixed income will be divided, if you follow my guidance, to be 20% in the uh, tips, the inflation protected uh, funds, 50% uh, in intermediate term funds, again, government bond funds, and 30% in short-term uh, government bond funds. So whether you're 40% fixed income or 60% fixed income, 
you're going to have half of that in intermediate, 30% of that in short term, and 20% in the uh, Treasury inflation protected uh, uh, bonds, securities. So um, what would have happened uh, as we look at the second pie graph and the table if we added these shorter term, the short to intermediate, instead of the longer term bonds, well, the first thing I notice is that the standard deviation declines. It's not a lot, but some. And, um, and the return uh, declines by one-tenth of one percent. Um, you'll notice when you compare portfolio one to portfolio two, that the $100,000 grew to slightly less, $32,780 less by taking this less risky uh, bond portfolio. And now that allows us, to the extent that we're trying to squeeze this portfolio for all the return we can, but keep our risk as low as we can, this allows us to put some more aggressive equities in the the portfolio, and we'll do that in, in just one second. So, so we did not do anything to improve returns. In fact, there's a slight decline, but a very small one, but, but a, a reduction in the volatility of the portfolio, and probably a better sense of protection and security uh, during a, a huge bear market where the governments, uh, in fact, I remember during the crash of 1987, there was uh, just a huge rush to government bonds because people were afraid the system was coming apart. So the third pie graph. Now I want to focus in step three, I want to focus on adding an asset class that does not go up and down with the S&P 500. It's non-correlated. But historically, and and we don't have the history of, uh, like we, with the S&P 500, people track it back to the 20s. Uh, we can go back to 1972 and look at the returns of real estate investment trusts, an index of all of the public trusts. And here's what we know about these REITs. By the way, uh, these, are, uh, these are holdings of commercial real estate in a public security. They could be malls, apartment houses, office buildings, land, uh, even could be some mortgages and other kinds of, uh, of fixed income securities that have to do uh, very specifically with real estate. But what we know from 1972 through 2002 is that the REIT index compounded at 10.9% and uh, the S&P 500 at 8.9%. So there's a 2% advantage to the REITs. And so anytime I can find a, a, an asset class that gives me the chance, gives you the chance as well, to increase your return. And look what happens as you look at the step three pie graph and the numbers in the table. You'll notice that we've only added a 12% position, 20% of the equity portion in the REITs. That this is not a huge holding and it's even going to get smaller as we go along, but at this point it's one-fifth of the equities. Notice the return goes from the original 8.5 percent to 8.7, added two-tenths of one percent. And the standard deviation, because the REITs don't go up and down together with the S&P 500, actually declines to 10.4%. So we have taken two steps to reduce the risk, and we have increased the return by two-tenths of 1%. Now, what impact does that have over that 43-year 43, 43 period? Well, your original $100,000 has now grown to be worth almost $3.7 million, about $400,000 more, four times what you originally invested. By taking a little slice of this 
actually relatively secure and trustworthy asset class. Doesn't always go up as we know full well know, but but long term it has produced a very a very good return. So now with with just two very simple steps, nothing complex, no gurus, no predictions of anything. Just expose yourself to another asset class, and uh, and because of the non-correlation, reduce the risk, and you now have added almost four hundred thousand dollars to your return. May not change your life, but uh, it will certainly make your children happy that you did that. All right, let's go on to step number four. Now this one is going uh, to have a bigger impact. Uh, because, well, number one, it's a riskier asset class, and that is to add small companies to the portfolio, what they call small cap stocks. And the theory is, is that small cap stocks, well, that's what at one point Microsoft was and Procter & Gamble. I mean, at some point in their in their business career, they were small, they became larger. And when you're small, you have a lot of upside potential. You also have the risk of default of the company not making it. So when you do add small cap stocks to your portfolio, you want to add thousands of them, and that's the beauty of an index fund or ETF, is that you can you can access this asset class with, uh, uh, with portfolios of, of thousands of companies, all of them individually pretty risky. Now, what we know, looking back over long periods of time, that small companies have produced a, a couple percent more. Now, they, when I say small companies, I'm talking in this particular case happens to be micro cap, but that would be true of the, what they call the small cap blend uh, asset class. But here's the key. You add these small companies to the portfolio, and because historically they've done better, um, but they're more risky than the REITs. This is going to push your standard deviation up a little bit to 10.8%. But it also pushes the annualized return, and I think it's important, I'll just comment right here, um, that this, the return that you see here in these, uh, each of these additional uh, equity asset classes do reflect uh, management fees as if you went to an advisor to have this done. Uh, and uh, as you can do this at Vanguard on your own, if you use an advisor, you would probably use an advisor that uses a family of funds that have done better than Vanguard in the equity area of the portfolio but the return after an investment advisory fee will be about the same as Vanguard, almost exactly the same. So what you see here is probably close to what might have been achieved with Vanguard or with, I, I would hope certainly, the DFA funds after having paid somebody a management fee to do it for you. That may be too much information, I apologize, but in a in a couple of months, I'm going to do a podcast on the Vanguard versus DFA, so you'll understand that more fully. But I want to focus on that half a percent. Added a half a percent to the uh, to the original 8.5. Now we're at 9%. The standard deviation is still below where we started. And you now have over $4 million in the portfolio almost $800,000 more than what you uh, started with. I guess if we look at it, uh, the, that $800,000 difference, about 400 of that came from the REITs, and the other 400 came uh, from the small cap. Overall, that's about a 24% increase now in uh, the return. And, uh, and again, always important without taking uh, more risk. And now we move on to a huge uh, uh, asset class. Uh, huge in the sense that historically it's just paid wonderful premiums, both for small cap and for large cap, and that would be value stocks. 
uh, growth stocks, the more popular ones, uh, those are the ones, those are the companies where profits are rising and they're may probably in some good growth area and they probably dominate the market that they're in and, and if they don't now, people think they're going to. These are great companies. At the other end of the spectrum, we have values so of growth. Those are the, the, the great companies in the eyes of investors willing to pay up for those companies. Value, those are the stocks that for some reason are out of favor. It could be the industry, just an industry that doesn't appear to have a great uh, future. It could be management problems, union problems, FDA problems, problems with the government. Uh, any number of things could put companies out of favor. Remember back in, uh, uh, in the late 90s when bricks and mortar kinds of companies sold for very little while the, uh, the technology companies uh, were, were having huge returns. So the ultimate buy and hold strategy uh, uses, uh, in essence, a mechanical way to identify what would be a value company. And in fact, it's not something that I came up with, but is the way that uh, Dr. Fama and Dr. French uh, who are, for those of you who are familiar with their work, they are uh, an integral part of the, the way that Dimensional Funds manages their value funds, very, very different from, from Vanguard. But the bottom line is this, is that they use a relationship of the book value of a company to the market value. And those that have relatively high book to market uh, values are those that are would be considered most out of favor, more deeply discounted value companies. So, so if we look at the returns of the of the value indexes, just to give you some historical perspective, if you looked from 1927 through 2012, the U.S. large cap growth index, pure growth, produced an annualized return of 7.7. .7. The large cap value index, a return of 10.6. So that's a huge advantage uh, to, the, uh, to the value. And it's true, by the way, of small cap value, uh, 8.1 uh, for the growth small cap index and 13.1 for the value, a small cap index. So uh, again, a huge premium. And it shows up when you look at the 1970 through 2012 period in uh, step five, adding value stocks to the portfolio. Now we're actually going to add two slices. We're going to have a small cap slice of value and a large cap slice of value. So at this point, that 60% equity position in the portfolio is one-fifth each S&P 500, the REIT index, the small cap micro cap index, U.S. large value index, and U.S. small value index. You've got over 5,000 companies represented here instead of 500. And look at the huge impact that had on the, the annualized return. It, it jumps almost a complete percent from 9% to 9.9. .9, and the standard deviation goes up as well from 10.8 to 11.6, right back where we started in terms of volatility. And yet you have added almost a percent and a half to the return. And this latest change added another $1.6 million. So now your, your portfolio five return is $5,681,000. A huge advantage by adding value. No wonder people uh, uh, give uh, uh, Warren Buffett's kudos for 
his awareness of that. In fact, he, he learned it from Benjamin Graham when he was going to uh, Columbia University. And so this, nothing, this is nothing new. It's just that the academics have looked at value and growth through a, uh, a, a different lens than the way that Warren Buffett would uh, identify value. But the bottom line is value needs a part to be part of a portfolio. Now you got to you got to be aware there are times that value is going to underperform growth. That certainly happened in the late 90s. There's going to be a time that small cap and a long period of time that small cap is going to underproduce large. From 1970 through 2000, small cap underperformed large cap, not by much, but where was that 2% advantage? You had to wait another 10 years to see that advantage uh, uh, show up in your, in your return. But for a long time, small cap was in essence out of favor compared to historical norms. So now we have a portfolio that has big and small and value and growth and, 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 and the REITs as well as having the 40% committed to the government bonds, intermediate to short term. Now step number six, the final step, is, is, uh, is as impactful actually, almost, as, uh, as the, uh, the addition of value. And that is to add international stocks to the portfolio. What do we know about international stocks? Well, first of all, we actually know through very long periods of time that international stocks do better than U.S. stocks. We also know there's a currency difference, so that when you, uh, during periods of time that the U.S. dollar is in decline, that will help the value of international securities. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is that when the U.S. dollar is stronger, that's going to be an advantage to U.S. securities, a disadvantage to internationals. What the academics tell us is that adding the, the, that, that international component in terms of currency will not add additional return over a long period of time, but it will modify, moderate the volatility. The fact is that some of the indexes, the small value and the small blend, the, the emerging markets, uh, as asset classes have historically done uh, better than the uh, equivalent U.S. asset classes. So as you look at pie graph number six, look at all these little pieces, little 6% pieces, because now we're going to add the EFA, which is the the large cap blend, similar to the S&P 500, but that's the international uh, exposure to that asset class. Then there's a international large cap value and a small cap blend and a small cap value and a emerging market. So now you have not only uh, more than uh, 12,000 different companies in the portfolio, but you have balanced a portfolio that is basically half large and half small. Half, yeah, a little more than half value and a little less than half growth. About half U.S. and half international. And over that 43-year period, the compound rate of return is 10.5%, a full 2% better than our benchmark and at almost exactly the same standard deviation. Now, what's not to like about this strategy? Well, I can tell you what's not to like. There are parts of it that for long periods of time are going to be stinkers. Look at the S&P 500 for a decade. It loses about 1% a year. There are periods the international securities don't do well. But all of these asset classes have very long-term histories of success. And we get back to 
whether it's because of currency differences or because of different asset classes, they don't go up and down together. Now, sometimes people will say, well, look, the international's going up and so is the U.S. But maybe the U.S. is going up much faster. The same thing in decline. It's rare that you're going to have the, the U.S. in a free fall and internationals going up. That's not to be expected. When you've got a real bear market, you would expect them all to go down. When you have a big bull market globally, which usually they are, when you have that, it's a question of do they go up and down at the, uh, up at the same rate, just as do they go down at the same rate when they're in a bear market. So this is what I have concluded is the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. But let me tell you what else can go wrong. For the next 30 years, growth may be better than value. Okay, we've got it. Just like when value was better than growth. Well, we still, we had the value, but we still had some growth. It may be for the next 30 years that small cap will underperform large cap. Great, we've got the large cap. And while internationals may have been more profitable in the past, maybe for the next 30 years they won't, it's okay, because this portfolio is not built on some promise of a particular industry, some promise of a political political structure. It is really built on asset classes, identified not by the good ones and the bad ones, but by those that are large and small, growth and value, U.S. and international. Now, you've got to put this to work. Now, before you put it to work, I hope that you will listen to uh, my podcast that I'll be doing in a few weeks on fine-tuning your asset allocation. Because once you believe all of what I've just presented, if you do, then the next question will be how much should you have in fixed income and how much you should you have in equities. And I will address that in a, uh, a, a podcast that will focus on that. All the way from all fixed income to all equities in 10% increment changes. Where do you fit on that spectrum? As I said earlier, I'm 50-50. If I'm talking to a, a young investor, I want them to be 100% in equities, but I want them to own the emerging markets and the REITs and the small cap and the large cap and the value and the growth and the U.S. and the international. It's a question of how much of their portfolio will be in equities. That podcast, I hope, will help you. I will make one other point about the recommendations, the REITs. REITs are best held for tax reasons inside of a tax-deferred account, an IRA or a 401k. So if it's a taxable account, I would just take the REITs out and divide, instead of in fifths, divide the U.S. equity portion in quarters. And finally, what funds to use. As I mentioned earlier, for those of you uh, who are interested in having somebody else do the management for you, I will be doing a podcast, and I've written about this in, uh, in the appendix uh, in Financial Fitness Forever. Uh, there's an appendix that's devoted to the comparison of returns and risk uh, and diversification of DFA versus Vanguard. But for people who are do-it-yourselfers, I, I want you to go to paulmerriman.com, and I want you to look at my Vanguard recommendations, and I would like you to look at my ETF recommendations because you can come very close to what I'm talking about here with the ETFs. And by the way, with the free ETFs, commission free, I should say, uh, not free, but commission free at Fidelity, at Vanguard, and at Schwab. I do want to, I mentioned earlier that I want you, for those of you who are interested in all of the data that is behind this uh, this presentation and the disclosure, what were all the assumptions that I used, uh, that would be found in the article 
on my home page entitled The Ultimate Buy and Hold Strategy. My goal for every one of you is to help you find the best way to diversify your money, not just in terms of equities, but fixed income and equities. I want to find the best asset classes. I want to find the best way to, to, to mix and match these asset classes. Now, for those of you who have some sort of leverage, this is not a financial leverage, but a personal leverage with a, a child or a grandchild that might be starting the investment process, I would love it if you would share this podcast with them and share the article with them in the hopes that as they start to build their investing for a lifetime, that they will make the right decisions from day one. As always, I appreciate it, particularly on these long <laughs> recordings, that you stick with me, hear the whole story, and hopefully get something out of it that pays you a huge reward in your financial future. Thanks for listening. That was Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.